Nothing I've said so far was... <laughs> so there seems to be a predominant color here this morning. What could it be? Why did it happen? With, with all due deference to, to David Sullivan, who's in the back row and who's a, uh, who's a Bostonian, so, uh, but <laughs> next time, next time. <laughs> yeah. Red Sox forever, there you go. <laughs> Perfect. So, welcome. This is our first of six summer sessions. We'll have two this month, two in July, two in August. The next two, I mean sessions three, four, five, and six, will be over back in the Spirituality Center, and they'll be on Wednesday. So we're here because there's a training going on over in the Spirituality Center uh, right now. So we're, we're kicked out of there. But we'll be back in there in July and in August. So these two weeks, we'll be talking about uh, the Gnostics and some other early Christian sects or denominations, if you will, or communities. In July, we'll be talking about um, what Israel was like in the first century at the time of Jesus. So what was the social, political, religious, economic environment? What was going on at the time of Jesus? Because that, that, I think, does matter. And then in August, we'll be looking at three of the Gospels that never made it into the New Testament. Okay? Three of, of several. Those are not the only three. <laughs> so today, we want to start talking about who were the Gnostics. And in order to begin to address that question... Um, I, I think it's important to understand the situation of early Christianity in its first 100 or even 200 years. So, <clears throat> first of all, uh, Christianity was kind of all over the place. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in my map. I went to Amazon and found a map of the Roman Empire in 117. It's an old map because it says AD. That's okay. We know, that, you know, we know what it means. So Christianity, of course, you know, started in, in Israel here, but it spread, and it spread relatively quickly up this way, and then eventually it made it to Rome, and it also spread this way. So there was quite a presence in North Africa, okay, Egypt. Alexandria was a hotbed of Christianity relatively early on. So imagine, you have Christians here, you have Christians here, and uh, here, here's Carthage. You know, think about it. You, it. Before long you had Christians in what is now France. Then it had the uh, very um, sweet sounding, romantic sounding name of Lugdunum. Thank God we don't say, I'm going to Paris, look Dunham this year, you know. It just doesn't have the same ring, does it? Uh, uh, there, was, uh, there were Christians in Iberia, there were Christians here and here. So, um, Christianity took many different forms it, because it, uh, it, it, it uh, existed in many different cultures. That's thing one to remember. Second thing is that for the first at least almost 300 years of Christianity, there was no Bible. So you have different communities. I mean, and, and why is there no Bible? Because there is no established central authority to say, this is what the Bible is. Okay? Uh, there, there is no uh, church of Rome, you know, church in Rome which dictates to everybody. There is, you know, there, there was no central authority. That's something that evolved over time. And so you would have different communities um, using what they considered to be scriptures. So the people of Corinth would, you know, consider Paul's letters to them. We have two of them. There may have been more. I think I've seen as many as, as five, okay? Uh, 
so you know you have those they were probably considered scripture and so maybe the people in Corinth used the letters to the Corinthians and the gospel of Mark let's just pick one but then you would have a community in Alexandria that would use the gospel of John let's say I'm, I mean, I'm just being hypothetical here and they would use the letter to the Laodiceans or something else and somebody else would use the, the shepherd of Hermas or the Gospel of Truth, or Ptolemy's letter to Flora, or you know all of these different things. So as you can imagine, Christianity was quite diverse, almost from day one. And you know when you think about it, you would you would almost expect it to be that way because even the apostles, if you want to go back that far. Each apostle experienced Jesus, but each apostle interpreted what they saw and heard in his own way. And then they, they brought what they heard and saw to different communities. And then there was the passage of time in which these different interpretations uh, were passed along by word of mouth. And then there was the decision finally to start writing down what they heard and saw, or what others heard and saw. Okay? So there, I think it's safe to say that of the scriptures and apocryphal, non-scriptural works that we have, not one of them, not one, was written by an eyewitness. Of Jesus. Paul never saw Jesus in the flesh. Jesus appeared to him either on the road to Damascus or somehow. You see what I'm saying? And Paul's Paul is the is the earliest scripture, scriptural witness to Jesus that we have. Je Paul never saw Jesus. Okay? So keeping all of that in mind. It's, you know, we have to get over this idea that Jesus, and I've, I've gone through this before, that Jesus had this, like, box of truth, right? His message. <laughs> and he gave it to the apostles and said, now here, take care of this. And don't forget any of it. Don't lose one word of what I'm telling you. And they said, okay, I got it. And then... They passed it on to the people who came after them, namely the bishops, who preserved it intact to this day. Okay, that is that there is a teaching in the church about that called the, the, the doctrine of apostolic succession. But in history, we know that's not what happened. That rather than one straight path of truth. And, 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 and anybody who diverted from that path of truth became known as a heretic by those who claimed to have preserved the box of truth. Rather, there were all different kinds of Christianities being taught and practiced. And it wasn't until the fourth century with the councils of Nicaea and Constantinople that uh, the uh, message, that, well, at least there was an attempt to unify the message. That unity of message is called orthodoxy. Okay? And even before the uh, councils of uh, Nicaea and Constantinople, there were Christians who were pushing and pushing hard for some kind of orthodoxy. And we can do a series on them someday. Uh, people like Irenaeus, people like Justin Martyr, people like Athanasius and others were those who said, we need one message. We all should be on the same page. Okay? There were other Christians, though, who didn't feel the same way. And even after the councils of, Constant or, uh, of Nicaea and Constantinople, they continued to practice variations of Christianity other than what was considered orthodox. So the Germans, for example, practiced what is known as Ar Arian 
Christianity. No, not not the Aryan nation, but the, the Christianity of Arius, uh, well into the eighth century. Uh, there were other forms of Christianity that continued to be practiced, Nestorianism and Docetism and all these kinds of things. Okay, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. So I will refer to those people who were pushing for everybody being on the same page. I will refer to them as the proto-Orthodox. So think of proto-Orthodox in the same way that you think of a prototype, okay? A first type, a first a first model, right? So these are the first Orthodox. But Orthodoxy, of course, was defined. And in history, there was a struggle over what Orthodoxy would be, okay? It was not a foregone uh, conclusion. Okay. Uh, another uh, factor in history that uh, has helped us to see just how diverse Christianity was were two discoveries back in the 1940s that have been studied intensely ever since. First, we're uh, probably familiar with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I get to now use my laser pointer. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> they, they, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were discovered out here by, believe it or not, the Dead Sea, <laughs> in, in the, the community of Qumran uh, in 1946 or 47. The second was the discovery of uh, a Gnostic library in northern Egypt. Northern Egypt, there's Egypt up in here somewhere. Uh, at Nag Hammadi. And uh, the Nag Hammadi discovery in particular has revealed to us uh, what the Gnostics really believed. Because prior to that, almost everything, besides just some fragments, everything that we knew about the Gnostics was written by their mortal enemies. Okay? People who hated them and considered them to be not just wrong, but sent to earth by the devil to lead Christians astray. So as you can imagine, their depiction of the Gnostics wasn't very flattering. Okay? Let's put it that way. All right. Uh, all right, so there's that. Note that all of the forms of Christianity that I will be talking about over the next two weeks were condemned by the proto-Orthodox. All of these were condemned by the proto-Orthodox. Okay, they were considered heretical, heresies. Okay, so who were these Gnostics anyway? Thing one, they never called themselves Gnostics. The term Gnostic is something that I think dates to about the uh, 1700s, I'm pretty sure. Some scholar, and I'm, I, I'm not sure who it was, referred to these different sects of Christians as Gnostics. And the reason why was because despite all their, their differences, one of the things that they believed in common was that uh, certain Christians were saved by receiving secret knowledge from Jesus, directly from Jesus. And the Greek word for that secret knowledge is gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. -S. And so they were referred to as Gnostics. And you see, uh, you know, books that refer to Gnosticism. That's a, um, I'm, I'm leery about using the term Gnosticism. Uh, although, you know, there are, there are plenty who do it, because when you, when you name something an ism, you are kind of giving it, a, you know, a, a, a sense of unity that these Gnostic sects really did not have. There were certain beliefs that they held in common, but their practices were different. Uh, they were affiliated with churches. The Gnostics did not form their own communities. They were attached to already existing Christian communities. They just considered themselves to be better than those other Christians in their community, all right? They were elitists. They were definitely elitists. Okay, but I think their story is worth hearing because it, it, it's, it's a very, very different understanding of 
who Jesus was, how the world came to be, who God is, how we're saved, all kinds of things. Okay, so where did these people come from? Nobody really knows. After all, I, you know, I, I actually did a, a, a presentation 35 years ago about the origins, back then I called it the origins of Gnosticism. I wouldn't have called, named it that anymore. And um, the things that I'm reading now say pretty much the same things that I said 35 years ago. So there's not, you know, the scholarship hasn't advanced very far at all. So there are elements of Jewish thought, Persian thought, oh, hey, where is Persia? Well, it's right here. <laughs> here it's referred to as Mesopotamia. Today it's referred to as Iraq. Uh, so there's Persian thought, there's elements of Christian thought in it, Greek thought, Egyptian thought, and even Hindu thought. Okay, so... Uh, the, uh, the intellectual underpinnings, if you will, of Gnosticism are quite diverse. Uh, it, the, the Gnostic worldview was formed in, um, by, by, by two primary influences, or so it seems. One was the Jewish apocalyptic view that I will explain the Gnostics rejected the Jewish apocalyptic worldview. The second uh, major influence was uh, Platonism, the philosophy of Plato. But not just any philosophy of Plato, what is referred to as Middle Platonism. Okay, Plato himself existed in the 5th century BC. He lived in the 5th century BC. So he was already quite dead by the time the Gnostics <laughs> came around. Okay, but his philosophy lived on, and it still does. All right, so what is this Jewish apocalyptic view? Well, it is a view that was uh, quite common and believed by many Jews during the time that Jesus lived. And the view was basically this, that God was about any day now, about to overcome the forces of evil in the world. Those forces were both in the heavens, Satan, and they were on earth, our friends, the Romans. So, how would Jesus do that? Well, the apocalyptic view, had, you know, there, were more than one, there was more than one apocalyptic view. But they all pretty much agreed that God would send his divine agent, his anointed one, his Messiah, to take care of this, to uh, kick out the forces of evil, and to restore the reign of God on earth. And once the reign of God was restored on earth, there would be no more sin, no more evil, no more suffering, no more death. Okay? Quite an idealistic view. Jesus himself, as I said, seems to have uh, been a believer in this apocalyptic view. Notice what he says, or what Mark has him say in the ninth chapter of his gospel. Truly, I tell you, some of you standing here will not taste death until you see the kingdom of God having come in power. Jesus is saying in the Gospel of Mark, it's a coming. It's a coming any day now. Or this from the 13th chapter of Mark. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. It also appears that Jesus uh, believed that God was going to send uh, a, a messenger who he referred to as what? As the Son of Man. This uh, messenger from God that was first referenced in uh, the book of Daniel that we just talked about when we were discussing Revelation. And this Son of Man would come to earth as a judge to judge uh, everyone, to judge the whole earth. Remember we talked about that. Okay. 
After Jesus died, well, it's, it's not clear that Jesus necessarily considered himself to be the Son of Man. You know, because like when, he, when he's questioned uh, by Pilate, he says, uh, Pilate says, are, are you the king of the Jews? He says, uh, you say it, and soon the Son of Man will come upon the clouds. So is he referring to himself in the third person, or is he referring to somebody else? Not clear. Be that as it may, Jesus' followers came to believe that Jesus himself was the Son of Man. Uh, and that he would be returning soon to judge the earth. Right? They were, there was this expectation that Jesus was going to come back any day and he was going to take, you know, finish the job of restoring God's reign on earth. Um, Paul, at least for one, seems to have believed this. If you look at the first book of, uh, or his first letter to the Thessalonians, he makes reference to that, that um, if you read 1 Thessalonians, it's not very long, you'll see that Paul has this view that uh, Jesus is coming back real soon. So if you're not married, don't get married, you know, and all, the, all this kind of stuff. Stay, just keep doing what you're doing because Jesus is coming back real soon in the twinkling of an eye. You know, he says that, you know, Jesus will be returning. And what, we don't know the day, we don't know the hour. Yeah, Ken. I thought we were always taught that the Bible is inerrant. We, we, we it, it is. <laughs> <laughs> but then, how could Jesus be looking forward to the end coming in, you know, a couple of days or all? Yeah. yeah that's a great question. Um, you know, from the, from the point of view of history, you would have to say that either Jesus himself got it wrong or, or that his followers who interpreted what they understood him to say got it wrong. You know, you know that, that's, a, that's another series. Well, well, you know, what, 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 did Jesus, what did Jesus actually say and do? You know, uh, it would be a short series because we don't know much about what Jesus actually said or did. So what happened, you know, so, so the, way it's, the way it's understood now is that, you know, when Jesus said soon, you know, that was kind of an ambiguous term that he didn't mean that soon. And so the early church was forced to reinterpret what Jesus meant by I'm coming back soon. And of course, here we here we are, and 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 we're and we're waiting for it, right? So, it you know the, the Bible had to be reinterpreted. The understanding of what Jesus was saying and what Paul was saying had to be reinterpreted. And it, you know, and it was, and it has been. So anyway, so Jesus didn't return soon. I mean, at least soon in the sense of in a matter of days, months, or years. He didn't come back. So that led both the Proto-Orthodox and the Gnostics to question this apocalyptic view. Right? And so the Proto-Orthodox said, hey, when he said soon, he meant sometime in the unknown, in the unknown future. Okay? But the Gnostics uh, questioned this apocalyptic belief even more. They went, well, remember I said that when Jesus would return as judge, there would be no more sin, no more evil, no more suffering, no more death. And the Gnostics said, well, wait a minute, all of those things are still here in abundance. Okay, and Jesus has not come back. So they even went much farther than the Proto-Orthodox. And they questioned whether or not the, the world itself uh, was created by God. At least by the Supreme God. Because they said, how could 
How could a perfectly good God, how could a perfectly good supreme God create a world where so much bad stuff happens? It's not a stupid question. It's, it, you know, it's, what is, you know, what was the answer of the, of the proto-orthodox? Well, the world was perfect until Adam and Eve screwed it up. <laughs> right? The, the Gnostics rejected that idea. They said that, and this is where, the, this is the influence of, of Plato. They said that the earth, because it is material, you know, because it, you know, it, it's, uh, because it's not purely spiritual, is in itself evil. That's the influence of Middle Platonism, that the world itself, because it is not spirit, because it is not pure spirit, is, is, uh, it, it is by nature evil. And so it could not have been created by a good God who is pure spirit. So what was their conclusion? Their conclusion was that there had to be a second God a lesser God who was not perfect, who created the world. And I will get into that story uh, in a minute. Okay? So, that then has an influence on their understanding of how the world is redeemed. If the world is by nature evil, it is irredeemable. It can't be fixed. You see, where, see their logic? The world itself is much more, it, well, is basically evil. That being the case, it can't be redeemed. So what is the other, what, what, what's the alternative? The alternative is that the goal of human beings is to escape it, get out of it, and uh, elevate ourselves into the world of spirit. That was their story, okay? So we have to, the, the goal for them was to escape the world, not to redeem the world. Okay. Um, so let, let's, just, let's just talk about the, uh, uh, the story. Well, yeah, let's, let's talk about the Gnostic story. This is the Gnostic story. Uh, worldview, their story of God, their story of creation, their story of, of salvation. As I said, there were many, many different Gnostic groups, Gnostic communities, sects, whatever you want to call them. But they all had a, a number of beliefs pretty much in common. Okay, beginning of the story. In the beginning, there was one supreme God. This God is pure spirit. This God is unknowable. This God is all-knowing, all-powerful, immovable, perfection itself. Okay? This is the God. This, this idea of God is taken largely from Plato. And if it sounds familiar, the God of Christianity, the God of Orthodox Christianity was also, if you will, Platonized. This, is, this, this God of Christianity is not exactly the same as the God of Israel, okay, who was conceived differently. The understanding of who God is evolved under the influence of, of Greek philosophy. Okay, so, this supreme God uh, for some unknown reason, began to generate uh, lesser gods, lesser deities. So this is how they tell the story. So the, 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 the supreme god is just there, chilling, okay? Just being God. But the supreme god had a thought of himself. All right, well, what else is there to think about? Right? So the Supreme God thinks about himself, and that thought takes on independent existence. 
and becomes a reflection or a, a, an emanation is their word, an emanation of the Supreme God. And then that emanation thinks about himself and there is another emanation. And so there is the creation of a, a pantheon. If you, if you Googled Gnostic pantheon or a first century, second century Gnostic pantheon, you'd see all kinds of, you know, uh, there's one and there's two and there's four and eight, 16, 32. Some of them had eight, some of them had 64. There's all kinds of things like that. Uh, so then the attributes of the perfect God, wisdom, Okay, God is the, the supreme God was all wise. That wisdom emanated from the supreme God and became another deity. God's knowledge became another deity. You know, I know, I know it's different. <laughs> so there were all these other emanations, and these were the I think I have this word in the notes the aeons, A E O N S. Okay, these lesser deities that emanate from God are called the aeons. <clears throat> okay. And the entire pantheon, think about the term pantheon. It comes from two Greek uh, roots. Pan, which means all. You know, a pandemic is a disease that affects everybody. A panacea is the cure to that thing. It cures everybody. And theos. Uh, God, so all the gods, so the pantheon of gods were re was known as the, the fullness or the pleroma. So when you, if you ever see that term pleroma, that's all of these gods, the supreme god and then all these lesser gods. One of the things that the orthodox had to do to counter the idea that somehow the Son and the Holy Spirit were emanations uh, from God the Father was to say no. They were not emanations. The, the Son was begotten of the Father. Remember the creed. And, uh, and the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father and the Son. They had to, they had to create different words to, to explain where the Son and the Holy Spirit came from because they did not want to sound like they were Gnostics. Does that make sense? Okay, so there's all these different... Uh, emanations. <clears throat> and then there is one of, one of the aeons, whose name is Sophia, which is the Greek for wisdom, decides to generate a deity without her, uh, without her male partner. And <laughs> I don't know how, but, there, but this produced a, a, a malformed offspring. So Sophia afraid that this would be discovered, that her, you know, misdeed would be discovered, leaves this newborn deity on his own, not on the earth, but in kind of the middle area between the, uh, the realm of spirit and, the, and, and the, you know, and there is no earth yet, okay? The earth hasn't been yet created. And she names, do I have the name there? She names this deity Yaldabaoth. Yaldabaoth, okay? Uh, Yaldabaoth has more than one name, but that's the one that's most common. And think about it, Yaldabaoth is a derivation of the Old Testament God whose name was Yahweh Salahoth. Okay? Uh, keep in mind, the uh, Gnostics almost universally rejected the Old Testament. They didn't like the Old Testament, okay? And well, we'll see. And this Yaldabaoth is the Jewish God. Okay? So, then Yaldabaoth steals power from Mama, from Sophia, <laughs> and uses this power to create the world. Now, who created the world? Not the Supreme God, but this Yahweh Samaoth. That's consistent with Orthodox Christianity, right? That the God of Israel created this, uh, uh, created the earth. At this point, 
the uh, Yalda Ba'oth uh, takes on a title, and you might find this title in, in Gnostic uh, literature. It's the Demiurge, which is Greek for the maker. So I think I have the term Demiurge in there too. Yeah. yeah. So, as you can see, the created world is not created by the Supreme God, number one. And number two, because it is a material world, it is evil. It is matter and not spirit. And because of that, the Gnostics, this is their, their mindset as they're going through life. They saw the world as a place of suffering. It's a prison. And our goal is to get out of here. Get the heck out of here. Interestingly enough, Hindus believe the same thing. That the world is a place of suffering and it is the goal of, our, of life to, to uh, find right mindfulness so as to uh, move on to nirvana, the place of spirit. So that's why there are some who say that Hinduism influenced uh, Gnostic theology. So this Yalda Ba'oth, now he's created the, the earth, something the Supreme God would never have done, nor could he have done? And remember why? Because the Supreme God is a pure spirit and therefore incapable, not only not willing, but incapable of creating something evil. He's all good and therefore not capable of creating something evil. So, Yalda Baos does not know about the Supreme God. And so he declares, incorrectly and foolishly, I am God and there is no God beside me. Well, that is the claim of Yahweh, right? That is the claim, claim of the God of the Old Testament. Then he, you know, this is quite a story. He's, he has a vision of the Supreme God. And he says to the Supreme God, let us make man in our image. You see how they're borrowing from the story of Genesis here, okay? They're taking quite a different spin on it, but they're, they're using the story of, of, uh, uh, of Genesis. And so, Yalnabaoth creates Adam. Yalnabaoth, of course, is the one who does it, not the Supreme God. Again, because the Supreme God would not, would not and could not create something material. So Adam is, is a material man. Kind of sounds like a... Yeah, yeah. It's a, what's her name? Madonna. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Yeah. Popular culture. Escapes me. So um, he ha Adam has no spirit in him. Now we're moving... Now think about the story in Genesis 2, the creation of the man in Genesis 2. So the Supreme God tricks Yalabaoth into, into giving the spirit, uh, uh, his spirit into Adam. Uh, so how does he do it? He breathes the breath of life yeah. into him, right? Just like in Genesis 2. So uh, Adam is then cast into the material world. Okay, he's lived in this kind of ethereal middle ground somewhere, but now he's put on the earth. But the Supreme God has the final say, and he puts a thought into Adam. More, really, it's more than just a thought. He puts a spark of himself, a spark of his own divinity, his own perfection into Adam. That's important to remember. So there is a spark of the Supreme God. There is something of the Supreme God in Adam. So what does this divine spark allow him to know? He knows his true nature. His true nature is not that he is flesh and blood. His true nature is that he is spirit. His true nature is that he is one with the Supreme God. Number one. Number two, he knows that he has descended into this pit of evil called the world. 
And third, he knows the way that he can reascend back into union with the Supreme God. Adam knows this. Well, I shouldn't say that. It's at least in him. But he can't find it. He's not aware of it. Someone has to reveal it to him. Okay? It's in him, but he can't tap into that knowledge on his own. Okay? So far, so good. Supreme God can't create emanations. One of them is Yaldabaoth. Yaldabaoth says, I know, I'll just go create a world. Okay? Uh, creates a world. They, they, eventually, a man is created. The spirit is breathed into him. God leaves this spark of divinity in this first man and by extension into, into at least some of humanity. Uh, the world is a place of suffering and evil that needs to be escaped from so that we can or so that humanity can rise to the place of spirit. That's that's it in, in summary. Okay. So I, I, where I left it was Adam, and by extension, some humans, but the Gnostics believed not all humans received this spark of divinity. Only some received this spark of divinity, not all. And that's a sign of the elitism as well, the elitism of these people, right? Uh, I got the spark. Sorry, you know, it's kind of like you can hold it over other people. So the only way for those who have the spark of divinity to understand that they have it is to receive secret knowledge, gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. Okay, so this is a key. This is, I think, the most important distinction between the Gnostic view and the Proto-Orthodox view. Salvation for the Gnostics was found when those who have the spark of divinity in them receive this Gnosis and discover who they truly are. That is salvation to receive this knowledge and to discover their true self. Now, we know that salvation for the Proto-Orthodox and for us as well has come to be understood as Jesus dying for all of humanity to take away our sins. That is not the Gnostic understanding of salvation. You see, I mean, it's a dramatic difference. <clears throat> Okay? It's a huge difference. Salvation uh, uh, is, dis is receiving and accepting this gnosis, this secret knowledge so that we know who we truly are, that we are spirit, that we are actually part of God. Yeah, Margo? Oh, this is blowing my mind. <laughs> <laughs> because... <laughs> Isn't that exactly what Vatican II is telling us? Uh, I don't know if it's exactly what Vatican II is saying, but it, it you know, uh, it was wait, a say more. We are, <coughs> it is up to us to make the world a better place yeah. because we have part of God's goodness in us that we have to generate. To help make the whole place good. Yeah, I think some of that is, is would, the Gnostics would agree with some of that, but not all of it. Because the Gnostics would say, who cares what, what happens to the world? The world itself is irredeemable. Oh, well, that's true. You see what I'm saying? The world is evil. <laughs> yeah, the world is evil. Forget about it. Forget about it. Discover who you truly are. And get out of this world, escape this world into... And, and be reunited with God from whom the spark of divinity came. Well, see, that's what I hear the fathers of the church in Vatican II saying. Find out who you are, and if we find out who we are, yes. we're going back to the proto 
orthodox, maybe, for more of our identity to move forward. Yeah. So I, mean, I think we're still amalgamating, coming together, the cultures. I think of so all too. This area to us. There's something I think that's very contemporary in this uh, this idea that uh, it's important to come to know who we truly are. How many of the spiritual writers, the Richard Rohrs and the Thomas Mertens and, and those kind of people, have talked about the dichotomy between the true self and the false self? And how we have to discover the true self made by God, you know, made in the image of God. So in, in, that, in that sense, the Gnostics are, in a, you know, are saying something, I think, that's quite contemporary, quite modern. Where, where uh, I have trouble with them is the elitism that, you know, a couple of us here have the, you know, have, you know we're, we're the elect, we're the, you know, we're the in crowd, and the rest of you, sorry. You know, that's what, yeah. Well, doesn't that, it seems like there are still some Christian sects that sort of still believe in that, like, you look at the Calvinists, and they believe that your destiny is preordained. Yeah. Either you're going to heaven or you're going to hell. Yeah. And not all of us were put on this earth to be saved by Christ. Yes. And nothing that you did on earth was going to change what God predetermined. For you. And, yeah, that's. You, I, I agree with that. Now their their approach is somewhat is somewhat different, but they you know on that point they are in agreement. Look at the you know Seventh Day Adventists or the Latter Day Saints. You know there are the elect who will be taken up at the time of the rapture or the 144,000 or however you want to say it. And you know, sorry about the rest of y'all. <laughs> you know, yeah, there, there 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 is you know this kind of um, you know the select, the elite. That kind of thinking is still around. Okay. Now, orthodoxy would say, you know, uh, Catholic Christian orthodoxy would say that that all humanity has the possibility of being saved. That Christ's death on the cross removed the sins of all of humanity of, in all places and all times. So it is more inclusive rather than exclusive. Yeah, but there are sects of Christianity to this day that are exclusive. Yeah. We're in and you ain't. You know, that that, that, that kind of thinking. Yeah. Well, the Puritans, they were in or out and no matter how their life went, that indicated that they had been, they were in. Yeah, by, by the way you lived your life, you know, it, it was a sign of whether you were the elect or not. So, you know, if, if you uh, were uh, graced with wealth or whatever. That was a sign that God had favored you, you know. And so you should work hard so that you could have that and so you could have a little more assurance of, you know, being in the in crowd. Wasn't one, this one of our main aims is to bring about the kingdom? I mean, to back in the kingdom being in the back like the, the way Christ has shown us. Yeah, a more contemporary Catholic understanding of the, of the reign of God is that, the, you know, well, there's a couple different ones, but that the, the reign of God is already here, yes. but that it is our task, it is our mission to make it a reality in all its fullness by practicing compassionate love and justice and all of those all of those things. Well, hasn't it within the last few weeks even? Like uh, before Vatican II, or maybe after Vatican II, we were very much interested in getting the word, the word out, or stressing that. Now I think, in fact, I think when Father Bill spoke the Sunday, we talked. If he didn't call it the spark, it, that at least we are the ones that who have it. We're going to have to give it to take it to other people. Yeah. Yes. And that's going to be the emphasis. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and part of that is, is this idea of, you know, knowing, knowing who we are, knowing what we bring to the table, you know, and everybody has different gifts that we bring to, to the world, the table of the world, you know, to, 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 to um, again, there's, there's different metaphors, to restore it to what it had been 
before Adam and the sin of Adam and Eve, or to you know uh, make make the world the place where God's sovereignty is recognized by all. There's different ways of saying it. Yeah, yeah. It seems, it seems like the, this idea of predestination ignores uh, free will. Well, I think so too. You yeah. Have the opportunity to choose good or, or choose evil. Yeah. So does this. I mean, to, to keep it on the on on the Gnostics. Yeah. That my problem with predestination is exactly that. What difference does it make what you do? If it's already determined what where what your destiny is, you know, hey, go have some fun because you know you you made it. You know, you're in. Yeah. Who, who cares, right? The the. You, the free will that really doesn't exist. It, it, it really doesn't exist. But, but we know it does. And well, we we believe it does. We believe we act in freedom. I mean, right? we, we, we can prove that every day. We can, we can choose you one thing or choose another. Yeah, you didn't have to come here. Take your loss. You know, you didn't have to come here. The Blues did not have to win that game last night, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh. So everybody is the elect here. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I mean, as you can see, there are a lot of different understandings about the way God works and about what it means to be saved and how it happens and all of that. And the Gnostics had, Gnostics had their own. And please understand this too, in terms of history, there were quite a few Gnostics. There were a lot of them. There were Gnostic communities all, you know, all, all, all through the, uh, through the empire. Well, then what was the need for Christ to come for these people? Ah, thank you. That's right here. In my, that's my next note. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, why did Christ come? Christ came because it is through Christ and only through Christ that those who are the elect receive the Gnosis. Jesus came to share that secret knowledge with the elect. And it can only be received through Jesus. So Jesus is the Savior. But only to certain people. Only to certain people, and not by dying, but by his teaching. Okay? Now, by extension, Jesus... Uh, Jesus shares that gnosis with those individuals who are the elect. Okay? And the practical, uh, one of the practical implications of this is that the Gnostics were anti-authoritarian. <coughs> they were like, why do I need a bishop telling me what to do? Jesus is telling me what to do. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you know, so, so the Gnostics, each Gnostic considered herself or himself an authority unto themselves. And so that's one of the reasons why the Proto-Orthodox were very suspicious of them. Because the Proto-Orthodox believed that, um, that Jesus gave the box of knowledge to the apostles and then they passed it on to the bishops, you see. And so, if you want to know what to do, you don't look in here. You look to them. The bishop is Jesus' representative on earth. That's one of the main reasons why the Gnostics were held in such suspicion by the Proto-Orthodox. Can you see why? Each because they considered themselves to be an authority unto themselves. And they didn't need an external authority telling them what to do. Okay. So that then, you know, we've got to take another step back and talk about Jesus. If Jesus lived as a flesh and blood human being, how could that be? I mean, since flesh and blood is evil. Yeah. How can that be? So... Some of the Gnostics said, well, it's easy. Jesus wasn't really a human being. Either, um, he, either they say that he was a divine being, he was one of the emanations. He was, Jesus was an aeon, 
Okay? Je Jesus was not equal to the supreme God. Jesus was an emanation from the supreme God. They said either that uh, Jesus was one of these divine beings who entered this body temporarily, um, or that Jesus, you know, really n never did have a body at all. That it just appeared that he did. Uh, and, and, and in fact, they also said that, uh, like, when, when Jesus uh, died, well, appeared to have died on the cross, that wasn't really him. And this is one of the, 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 the part of the mythology, that on the way to Calvary, Jesus switched his identity. I'm not making this up. They did, I didn't. That, that, that Jesus switched his identity with Simon of Cyrene. And it was Simon of Cyrene who was on the cross. Looking like Jesus. <laughs> they did, Jesus pulled a switcheroo. Because, you know, Jesus couldn't die. Because, and think about this. Th this is something that, you know, it's worth pondering, you know, when you think about this in terms of history. One of the things that, that the... Uh, those who were not the proto-orthodox had a problem with was if Jesus is God, how can Jesus die? In other words, how can God die? God can't die. Right? And the Gnostics believed that too. So, you know, in their view, Jesus didn't die. He, <laughs> he, he put Simon of Cyrene up on the cross looking like him. That's how they explained it. Okay. So, as I've been saying, not all people can be saved. In fact, most can't. So there were three different classes of, of human beings. Some people were created by this Yalda Baos, this Demi-urge. So they have no spirit in them whatsoever. Forget about them, they're doomed, right? When they die, they simply become extinct. They're pure matter, and so, you know, they have, they have no hope. Some other people, there's a middle class of people who have a soul, but they don't have that divine spark from the Supreme God. So these people, they can have an afterlife, uh, you know, and they, you know, they, they but, but, but they don't, they don't, uh, they're not one with the Supreme God. So who created them? You know, I don't know. But, you know, um, they are probably, you know, I I'm thinking of the logic of the Gnostics. They're probably a, a, a combination of the Demiurge and some other Aeon. I'm, but I'm guessing when I say that. And then there are the elect. Well, the, the people in the middle, the people with soul, the, the soul people, they are the ordinary Christians. They're ordinary Christians, okay? So where it, do they go when they die? They go to the uh, spiritual realm, but remember in those days, the heavens, <clears throat> there was not heaven, it was the heavens, so they would dwell in one of the lower realms of heaven, but not with... Not with God, not with the Supreme God. Those with the divine spark are the Gnostics. They know who they really are, they know how they got here, and they know what they need to do to return to the spiritual realm. Okay? And these people will live on eternally with the uh, Supreme God, and they will be part of the Pleroma. They, will, they, they are emanations. They are aeons on earth. Okay? Okay. Everybody sufficiently confused at this point? <laughs> All right. So let's take a look at uh, a, a sampling of some of the Gnostic uh, writings and some of the Gnostic uh, leaders. The first one is, is the Gospel of Truth. This is a Gnostic writing that was found at Nag Hammadi. And one of the things that makes it different from most Gnostic writings is that it's actually joyful. 
Most Gnostic writings were pretty dark, as you can imagine. Okay? Why? Because the world is a you know, place of suffering, and it's, we got to get the heck out of here, and all that kind of thing. No one knows who wrote the Gospel of Truth, but some speculate that it might have been one of the uh, most well-known of the early Gnostic leaders, a guy by the name of Valentinus. He was the leader of a Gnostic Christian sect in the first half of the second century. Okay, somewhere between 100 and 150. Uh, the, the Gospel of Truth is not an account of Jesus' life like the scriptural Gospels. It's a celebration of the salvation that is brought about by Jesus revealing the truth that sets Gnostics free. So, uh, it, it, it talks about creation. <coughs> that the material world was, was created because of uh, a conflict up in the, you know, in the heavens. Uh, that salvation is through Gnosis. And uh, that is, well, and, and, and the third main part of it is that the world, the present world, the world that we live in passes away as soon as we accept Gnosis. We may be, to use a, 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 an orthodox phrase, we may be in the world, but we are no longer of the world, okay? So again, that kind of uh, the separatism. The, the, the habits of the Gnostics were uh, interesting. Some of them, just to use, you know, well, what, some of them were, were quite um, ascetical in their practices. They wouldn't eat much. They wore very simple clothes. Why? Because all of that stuff is evil. Okay? Some of them were celibates because they believed that to engage in sex is to engage in something that's, you know, material and therefore sinful, they are not sinful, just evil, it's wrong. On the other hand, there were some sects of Gnostics who were, um, um, uh, well, they, they had sex a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why they did is because they believed they were, I mean, like what we were just talking about, they were already saved, so what the heck, you know? <laughs> so it didn't, it didn't matter, it didn't matter. What, you know, whether they uh, you know engage in all kinds of uh, sexual orgies and you know and and whatever. Um, so the first sex would be coming state. Uh, yeah, and that has happened to that has happened to Christian sects through the years. It happened to the Shakers. Not very intelligent. Well, <laughs> not much money there. Not much. Well. <laughs> Is that, is that all getting picked up by the camera today? Let's yeah. all, or my, let's all. For a fee, I can edit it. <laughs> <laughs> this is going on YouTube, huh? <laughs> um, so, yes. Let's, let's take a look at some of the gospel of truth. This is the gospel of him whom they seek, which he has revealed to the perfect through the mercies of the Father as the hidden mystery of Jesus the Christ. Through him he enlightened those who were in darkness because of forgetfulness. Hear it? They, they have forgotten what was instilled in them. He enlightened them and gave them a path. He enlightened them. Showed them the Gnosis. And that path is the truth which he taught them. That is the Gnosis. For this reason, error was angry with him. Makes it sound like error is uh, you know, some kind of demon. Right? So it persecuted him. It was distressed by him. So it made him powerless. He was nailed to a cross. He became a fruit of the knowledge of the Father. He did not, however, destroy them because they ate of it. Uh, an allusion to Genesis. He rather caused those who ate of it to be joyful because of the discovery. And as for him, them he found, them he found in himself. And him they found in themselves. That illimitable, inconceivable one. Oops. That illimitable, inconceivable one, the Supreme God, that perfect Father who made the all, in whom the all is. What is the all? That's the pleroma, that is the fullness. 
uh, and whom the all lacks, since he retained in himself their perfection, which he had not given to the all. Okay, so that's the first thing. That's the gospel of truth. The second one is called Ptolemy's letter to Flora. Okay, who was Ptolemy? Yeah. Were all these found in Nag Hammadi, or are they found in different places? Most of them were found at, at Nag Hammadi. Yeah. What year was that? Nag Hammadi, the Nag Hammadi uh, uh, discovery was in 1945. It's actually, it actually was before the Dead Sea Scrolls, by a year or two. The Dead Sea Scrolls are much more well known, but the Nag Hammadi uh, discovery was actually first. Were these all were these all supposed to be written at the same time too? No, they were they were written probably in uh, a lot of them were written in the second century, but some of them were written you know after that. But they they were predominantly there. So so how did they get to uh, northern Egypt? Well, I mean they made they made their way there, and there was a. Uh, 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 a monastery, a Gnostic monastery in Egypt. But after the Council of Constantinople, uh, Gnosticism was consciously suppressed. And so some little monk buried all these, you know? He buried these books. These were in books, they were not in scrolls. And, uh, and, he, and he buried them and, and they were found by a guy, you ready? They were found by a guy named Muhammad Ali. Not that one, but they were found by a guy named Muhammad Ali. He brought them into a, into town, and I think, you know, he gave them to, I mean, you know, left them under the care of his mom, I think, or his wife or whatever, and mama actually burned some of the pages to start the, start the cooking fire yeah. in your house. Like, oh, let's see, I don't have any kindling. She, you know, she's tearing books out of these, you know, tearing pages out of these books. Mom, stop it. Okay, so the, the story of how Nag, the Nag Hammadi books came to be, you know, preserved, and you know, it, it, that in itself is a is quite a story. But first of all, what are there others that we know of that are missing? Yeah. yeah, and the reason why we know that is because they are referenced in. The, uh, the works of the Proto-Orthodox. You see, they make reference to them. Okay, like I think, yeah, Ptolemy's letter to Flora was not at Nag Hammadi, but my note here says, it was preserved, it was written down entirely by one of the defenders of Proto-Orthodox in the fourth century, a guy named Epiphanius of Salamis, okay? Epiphanius is one of those guys who condemned the Gnostics, but thank you, he wrote down the entire uh, letter to Flora so that he could diss it, so that he could criticize it. But lucky for us, he wrote the whole thing down. Was there uh, another, uh, any other, uh, besides Orthodox Christianity and the Gnostics, you said there were a number of Christianities. Yeah. Were there other uh, Christianities that are written down, but we haven't found? Oh, I mean, you know, in, yes. The answer to that is is yes. Uh, some um, are referenced in the writings of the Proto Orthodox. Others, there is speculation that that they exist. One author that I read said that of all the the scriptures that we have, and you can look there and you can look. Here, this is pretty much a collection of the. Not, these are works that books, letters, whatever that did not make it into the Christian scriptures. Okay, but one author that I have read said he believes that with this we have probably only about 15 percent of what was actually written like this from those days. What might the story look like if we had the other 85%? Some of it we may never found, find because it, it's, it would burn. You know, it was destroyed. The proto-Orthodox and the Orthodox, you know, they wanted to say, this is the way you're going to believe, and so get rid of all the other stuff. 
So yeah, th there, it's, 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 a, it's a virtual certainty that there's lots of other stuff out there that either hasn't been found or will never be found. Okay, so this letter is addressed to a woman named, obviously, Flora. Flora is uh, a proto-Orthodox Christian, and she wants, she's asking Ptolemy about what is the Gnostic understanding of, of Scripture. Okay? Uh, and, and, uh, I'm going to go back here. So Ptolemy answers her by saying that the Old Testament was inspired neither by God nor by the devil, but it was inspired by an intermediary, uh, you know, someone in between the two. And it was the intermediary, this in go-between, this person in, you know, this, this deity in between who wrote the Old Testament and some of the, some of the laws produced by this deity are perfect like the Ten Commandments. Some of them are less than perfect, like the lex talionis, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And some of them are uh, to be taken only symbolically and not literally, like the law of circumcision. That circumcision is not, you know, was never intended as a physical thing, but merely as a, uh, a spiritual thing. Okay? So, the law of God, pure and not mixed with inferiority, is the Decalogue. The Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. Right? Those ten sayings engraved on two tablets, forbidding things not to be done and enjoining things to be done, these contain pure but imperfect legislation uh, and require the completion made by the Savior. The completion made by the Savior, of course, is the Gnosis. There is also the law interwoven with injustice. This is that middle range, laid down for vengeance and the requital of previous injuries, ordaining that an eye should be cut out for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, and that a murderer should be avenged by a murderer. The person who is the second one to be unjust is no less unjust than the first. That's an interesting <laughs> idea of justice, isn't it? Um, he simply changes the order of events while performing the same action. Admittedly, this commandment was a just one and still is just because of the weakness of those for whom the legislation was made uh, and, uh, appropriate to the circumstance. Okay, thank you, Ptolemy. We're going to keep going here. Um, this is why when his son came, he just, oh, all right, all right, so we'll, we'll skip on here to finally, Ptolemy gets a little worried. Finally, there is the allegorical. This is that third category, or exemplary part, ordained in the image of the spiritual entrance, and that matters, I mean the part dealing with offerings and circumcision and the Sabbath and fasting and Passover and unleavened bread and other similar matters. In other words, uh, pretty much those things, those elements of Judaism that were uh, you know, taken on more or less by Christianity. Okay? So that's, the, that's Ptolemy's letter to... Flora. Uh, the third one is the treatise on the resurrection. This one was found at Nag Hammadi. What am I doing for time? Oh, I got about 15 minutes. Okay. So um, this one was written is written to a non-Gnostic Christian, at least that's the, the style, to answer questions about the afterlife. The Gnostic author, who is anonymous, says that the resurrection of the believer is real. It's not an illusion. It is real. But it's not a resurrection of the body. By now, we know that for obvious reasons. There is no need, you know, for a resurrection of the body. Contrary to proto-orthodoxy, which did, and orthodoxy, which does teach the resurrection of the body, right? So, instead, salvation in the afterlife merely involved the spirit, as the spirit rises up to its uh, true home, which is heaven. True believers... Um, uh, 
For true believers, only the spirit is saved by Jesus. Because the spiritual is real, and the material world and the material body pass away, utterly pass away, because they are evil and they are an illusion. So, a little bit of this. If you did not exist in flesh, you took on flesh when you entered the world. Why is it then that you will not take your flesh with you when you rise into the aeon? See the question? This is the question being asked by, being asked to the author. In other words, what, you know, and, and this is, this is uh, a setup. I mean, this is written totally as a setup. The question is asked by the author to the author so that he can uh, dismiss the resurrection of the body. Okay? This is a pure setup. Okay? Um, what is better than flesh is what animates. What animates, what gives life is the spirit. What came into being because of you? Is it not yours? Whoops. Doesn't it exist with you? But while you're in the world, what are you missing? That is precisely what you have attempted to learn. After the birth of the body comes old age, as some of us know, and you exist in corruption. But what you lack is a gain. You will not give up the better. You will not give up the better part when you leave. The inferior part suffers. But it finds grace. Nothing redeems us from this world, but we are members of the realm of all and are saved. We have received salvation from start to finish. Let us think in this way. Let us comprehend in this way. Okay, so on and on. Finally, the, the, uh, the Gospel of uh, Thomas. And then I will talk about, in the time remaining, about a couple of other uh, Gnostic, uh, Gnostic leaders. I'm not going to say much about the Gospel of Thomas because in August I will get into the Gospel of Thomas in depth. I'm, in August I will be talking about the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas, and the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. Okay, All of which are, I think, pretty, pretty doggone interesting. And none of which is very long. You know, they're, 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 they're an easy read. You could Google those Gospels today and read them if you were so inclined. Okay. Uh, the Gospel of Thomas was written in the first century AD, or CE, so it's quite old. And it was discovered at Nag Hammadi. Uh, it, 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 its message is totally Gnostic. To be saved, you have to discover the truth within yourself. Um, Gnosticism doesn't tell us what to believe. It challenges us to discover what is hidden within. Okay? Some uh, commentators have said that the Gospel of John, which is in the New Testament, may have been written in part, or one of the reasons why it may have been written was exactly to refute the Gospel of Thomas. Okay? The Gospel of John was not a slam dunk to be in the Bible. There was quite a bit of uh, discussion about whether it belonged, just like Revelation. But one of the reasons why it came to be accepted into the canon of Scripture, so the speculation goes, is precisely because it refuted the Gospel of Thomas. Okay? Think about what you, just one example. Think about what Jesus says about the light. I am the light of the world, right? I, I am the true light that comes from above. And what did the Gnostics say? Uh, no, the light is given, the light is given to me. Jesus gives me the light. And so John is saying, uh, no, no, he follow him. Don't follow yourself. Okay, that's just that's just one example of that. Um, okay. These are the secret sayings which the living Jesus spoke in which Didymus, Judas, Thomas wrote down. Um, someone, uh, wh whoever, whoops, whoever uh, came up with the name Didymus, Judas, Thomas. Didymus is the Greek word for twin. Judas is the uh, uh, Aramaic word for 
twin. So uh, you know, it's, it's it, either way you look at it. And the Gospel of Thomas, I should also mention, is a uh, is a saying. This gospel, it takes. You'll see here. See, it, you know, look at one, two, three. It takes isolated sayings of it. It recorded isolated sayings of Jesus without any context. You know, he's not at the Sea of Galilee. He's not. In, he's not uh, in Capernaum or he's not in Jerusalem. Any of those things. He's just speaking. Number one, and he said, whoever finds the interpretation of these sayings will not experience death. Number two, Jesus said, let him who seeks continue seeking until he finds. When he finds, he will become troubled. When he becomes troubled, he will be astonished, and he will rule over the all. That's the discovery of the Gnosis. Jesus said, if those who lead you say to you, see, the kingdom is in the sky, then the birds of the sky will precede you. If they say to you, it is in the sea, then the fish will precede you. Rather, the kingdom, this is the key. Oh, I keep pressing the wrong button. And there's only about three buttons, and I keep hitting the wrong one. This is key to Gnosticism. The Gnostic. Rather, the kingdom is inside of you, and it is outside of you. When you come to know yourselves, then you will become known and you will realize that it is you who are the sons of the living Father. But if you will not know yourselves, you dwell in poverty, and it is you who are that poverty. Hear it? Hear the Gnostic message there? Okay? Know, know thyself. All right, so I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to talk about the Gospel of the Ebionites. That's for next week. All right, so a couple of other uh, Gnostic leaders. The first one is Basilides. Okay? Basilides was from Alexandria. Oh, here. There it is. Alexandria in Egypt. Uh, and he was the leader of a Gnostic community from about 117 to about 138 CE. His main contribution is that he is believed, we don't have them, he is believed to have written over two dozen books that were commentaries on the Christian gospel. It was called Exegetica. So uh, Basilides was one of the very first uh, commentators uh, on the gospel. Um, the followers of Basilides formed this Christian community that lasted for at least two centuries. Why do we know that? Because Epiphanius of Salamis, the guy I, represent, uh, I, I uh, alluded to before, or mentioned before, <coughs> Epiphanius of Salamis, in the fourth century, he says that this community of Basilides still exists. So we're in the 300s. So, um, the, what, there's not a whole lot else about Basilides to be said, except for this, which I think is kind of, kind of fun. <laughs> Irenaeus and other pro, proto-Orthodox critics of Basilides and his communities um, believe Basilides to be the source of what is known as the Laughing Jesus. And that's where this, I already told this story about Simon of Cyrene, that on the road to crucifixion, Jesus transformed himself into Simon of Cyrene and vice versa. So it was actually Simon who died on the cross. And Jesus laughed about it. He laughed about the trick that he had pulled on the Romans and the Jews. So whether Basilides actually said that or not, is unknown, but those who criticized Basilides said that that's what he believed in, in the laughing Jesus. There was this legend about the laughing Jesus. And then the, <clears throat> the last one I'll talk about is a guy by the name of Carpocrates. Uh, he too led a community of Gnostics in Alexandria in Egypt, also in the second century. 
Uh, I don't think we have any of his. No, yeah, I don't think we have any of his writings either. But those who criticized him, the proto-orthodox people who criticized him, claimed that his followers were the ones. These are the ones who engaged in sexual orgies as part of their liturgy. Okay. Uh, they also claimed that the that the the Carpocrates community. Um, believed in wife swapping. Uh, but, and, and here's how the proto-Orthodox critics said was the reason why they believed that. They said that the, the Carpocratians, the followers of Carpocrates, be, uh, believed that God had made, ready? This is wonderful. God made all things to be shared by all. <laughs> how convenient, right? And this is a reflection of that uh, Gnostic belief that, uh, you know, the, the body is evil. And so it doesn't matter what we do with it. If you're saved, you're saved, and, that, and that's, that's enough. Yes? You keep on bringing up Alexandria. Yeah. So the Library of Alexandria, did that have Gnostic writings in it or Christian writings? I would presume that it probably had both, but I can't, I can't prove it, you know. Yeah. Uh, Alexandria was a, a hotbed of early Christianity. Two of the real hotbeds of, of Christian theology of all kinds were Alexandria in Egypt and Caesarea. Alexandria, here again. Caesarea, it's not on this map, but in here, in Syria. Here's, here's, maybe it's this one. There were like three different Caesareas, so you know, maybe it's this one here. Those were uh, two principal, uh, 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 those were two cities where there were schools of theology that were in competition with each other. And Alexandria was the home not just of Gnostic uh, theologians, but also proto-Orthodox and Orthodox theologians as well. Yeah, yeah. Alexand Alexandria was one of the early church's real uh, hotbed. It's the only word that comes to my mind. You had a question, too? Um, could women be Gnostics? I'm sorry? Could women be, have the spark be Gnostics? Be yes, they could. Was it equal? Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. So they... they they were egalitarian in the sense that both e that either men or women could have the spark of divinity in them. Um, animals, uh, no, I don't think so. Yeah, I, I've never, you know, I've never read anything from those days about animals, you know, uh, having any existence after life on this earth. Yeah, but, but men and women, yeah. How about that? They were elitist, but not sexist. <laughs> yeah, Jen. Mark, we, we talk about some Christian groups have pieces of Gnosticism in their beliefs. Are there any true, what would be called, Gnostics today? There are, there are Gnostics today, but they're very different than the Gnostics of, of this time, Gnostics of the first and second centuries. And they have all kinds of, you know, there's all kinds of different beliefs. I think what unifies them is, like with these people, this uh, emphasis on self-knowledge. I, I uh, suggest that maybe you, you uh, Google Gnosticism and you'll come up with millions of Millions of hits. Yeah, I mean, it would take you the rest of your life to, yeah. <laughs> to read all this stuff. Gnosticism still exists, but it's quite different than this kind of early Christian Gnosticism. Do one, one last thing, because it is 1059. How's that for timing? One last thing. Remember that the Gnostics, the followers of Basilides and Valentinus and Carpocrates and all these people, fully considered themselves Christians, okay? They, they, you know, they took the name, I am a, you know, they would never have said, 
agnostic, but I'm a follower of Carpocrates, and I am a Christian. So the, 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 the push toward orthodoxy was a push towards establishing uh, a set of beliefs that one had to hold on to in order to call himself or herself a Christian. And for the proto-orthodox, this Gnostic stuff was not part of that. <laughs> hey, I hope this was helpful. Uh, th thanks, thanks for, for coming in the middle of the summer. And, and listen, and, and we will be doing this again next next Thursday. Same time, same place, same channel. Thanks a lot. Thank you.